Hello, 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 and welcome to this edition of the Jolly Heretic. I have such a special guest for you today, and that is the South African writer Ilana Mercer. And while I sign into the old entropy, I'm going to ask Ilana to introduce herself to you. So, Ilana, over to you. Thank you, Ed. And this is where the new kid in in the class has to stand up and introduce herself to the, the professor makes her. Uh, yes, I've been writing a paleo libertarian column since 1980, uh, 1998. Um, it's based on first principles, and I apply those first principles to the day's events. I'm sure you will ask me what paleo libertarianism is. It's uh, libertarianism of the hard right. Um, and I think a lot of people emphasize the Beltway libertarianism, whereby, uh, you know, you talk about free markets, individual liberty, but the most important thing about libertarianism, at least mine, is the non-aggression axiom. Uh, you cannot, your myths stop at my face. You cannot in initiate aggression, not even if it's for the good of other nations, right? So that's why the same principles that I've um, promoted since 1998 are instantiated in my work today, and I have not changed. I was a dissident then. Um, I was uh, speedily syndicated when I came to the United States by creators in 2002. Um, it was in a record time of six weeks, uh, unprecedented. Very common word now, I'm, unprecedented. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, people are saying in the chat, I'm maintaining a long, a long mute. I'm not maintaining a long mute, but as with, uh, as with Michelle last week, um, I think it's a woman thing. Um, she, we're going to have higher linguistic oh, challenges. I have, I have, to, I have speaking, to introduce, I was banned in 2002, September 19, uh, 2002, when I came out against the Bush's war on Iraq. Banned Finch. by whom? Who were you banned by? Um, con oink, I was syndicated, and that you have to peddle your column to all the newspapers, and all the newspapers and websites of con oink uh, promptly said this column is neither Democrat, Democratic or Republican, and it's certainly anti war. And that's when I became persona non grata. Oh, yeah, uh, I see. I okay, well, okay, well, I've got a, okay, well, uh, uh, cheers, everybody. Cheers, cheers, uh, hello, cheers, coughing, uh, cheers, Ryan Thompson, cheers, uh, uh, cheers, Ilana. Uh, cheers, Steve. Uh, cheers, Slanger, Hurligan, Gurligan, K. Piss, uh, Skull, uh, Proust, Prost, uh, Slanger, Slanger Var, and all that stuff. And welcome to the Jolly Heretic. We are, of course, an online public house that meets on Mondays and Thursdays at 7 p.m. UK time, 2 p.m. New York, in which we discuss based science, uh, based research of all kinds that is increasingly expunged from our woke joke universities. And we also um, uh, discuss the researchers that we uh, interview, the chairs are Sandra RDS, uh, we, and the chairs sitting by the pound, and we also interview the people to do the research and various dissident people. And today I've got on uh, one of these people, and that is uh, Ilana Mercer, who is a South African journalist now based uh, in, uh, in in America. And uh, I believe it's America, America or Canada, I forget which. America or Canada, where you are. I uh, am now in the US. I'm the US. Uh, okay, so, yes. I it's 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 sound up, someone's saying. Uh, well, look, I, it, look, look, there's always problems with the sound or the light. Uh, people were speculating earlier that I take steroids, and someone said, well, you can see if, if he takes them because moan about the light or the sound, and then he'll get very angry. Uh, but <laughs> look, I, it's, it's as loud as it goes. So, what, what I would say to the people is turn your volume up. Anyway, cheers. So, um, Ilana, Ilana's written on various things, but she also wrote a very interesting book, uh, which has aged well. Uh, 10 years ago, there it is, look, if you want to buy, buy a copy of it there, uh, into the Cannibals Pod, which is basically advice for Americans about, uh, uh, from the South African perspective, because uh, South Africa uh, may well be our future. Um, so there we go. So look, let's think about this then. So um, what could America, it, it, to the extent that America kind of, you, you left South Africa when, like in the early 90s? Is that uh, right? It's ninety five. That's right. And had it had it already? I mean, it had only been a um, a, po a, a rainbow nation for a couple of years at that point. Uh, yes, um, was, yes. Was it, was it was it already? How how quickly did it become noticeable after the fall of apartheid and majority well, rule? Well, um, my husband, we 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 left at the uh, behest of my husband, who uh, saw things uh, that I did not see. I certainly did not want to leave family and friends, and I, of course, I have a great love. Of South Africa, I grew up in Israel, but still returned to South Africa um, from whence, uh, from where we left to Canada. Um, our honeymoon was spent dodging riots, so that gives you an idea. And that was in in '95. Uh, yeah, so things had already been heating up, but they were always kept under 
a you know people in the west call uh, south africa a police state but but that was not the case and certainly when we see um the united uh, states surveillance state and security state in action now um i don't think it's uh, i think it's actually worse than south africa because south africa was run by very a particular um based on the dutch roman law very particular white guys who went by the book and so i don't see that here um so yeah it wasn't uh, as yet noticeable when we left but uh, by 2011 when i published this book i had seen uh, south africa as a harbinger of things to come and felt that that analytically and structurally i wanted to break down what was in the what was in the future for america could not find a publisher but uh, i think i would today 11 years hence yeah, you probably would because it made so many correct prognostications can i just say two things first of all entropy is working and if you have any questions for ilana are we going to talk about south africa we're also going to talk about abortion a bit later which we we have a shared views on uh, and, and and the general decline of civilization so if you have any questions on that kind of stuff uh, then do send them in on entropy link is on the screen uh, or on youtube um, uh, and we will, of course, answer them today. I'd also note that people are saying very nice things about you in the in the in the sidebar, Ilana. They're saying that you're better than Nigella Lawson, which is uh, oh, that's, that that's refers to the looks. I think that's look. Yeah, well, you when I have women on, it's always the looks that are that are that are. That oh, are I think she's great. stunning. Certainly, um, we, she's a little older than me, but we're certainly in the same uh, bracket. Yeah, she's stunning. Thank you. So, so similar kind of age and Jewish. So I, th I think that's the that's the the, the, the point yes. of comparison. So no, um, so no Jewy comments yet. <laughs> no, no, the, the, you will you'll you'll get some anti-Semitic comments. Don't I worry, love my comments. I love those. I love those. You'll, you'll get some. You'll the get best, some. The best is when they remind me I'm not white, and of course my mother always said I had olive skin. So I'm I, I accept that with. Uh, I'm, are you I'm, are you are you Ashkenazi Jewish? I'm Ashkenazi. I'm sure there's some Sephardi in in us. Uh, um, but certainly from East East Europe, uh, Russia. My grandfather, uh, my his father, um, immigrated to South Africa of all places from Russia. Okay, sorry, I, uh, Carlotta's saying my sound is lower than yours, so I've turned my sound up. There's no more I can do. Look, it's as loud as it goes. Um, okay, so uh, so what can we expect uh, to happen? Oh, I didn't like that. I've got a feedback thing. It sounds constant. The bane of my existence is technology. Um, so what what is what, what can we in your book you 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 set out a number of predictions didn't you a number of things which you expected would would you, you said what South Africa was like and it was it was sort of instructive um for uh, Americans and you talked about you know the nature of Mandela and what he was like and all this sort of thing so so um to to what extent are we do you think there are clear parallels between what's happened to South Africa over the last 30 years and what's happening to America now where is America now is America in the early 90s of South Africa what do you think I think America is there, except that the America is so big and the economy is so huge that, that, that those of us who are fortunate and, and work for a living and are productive uh, can't, don't feel it yet. But America is there. In fact, uh, a while ago, my, my readers were furious with me because I came out uh, with a positive uh, column about South Africa's attitude to the riots. They had riots recently uh, in 2001, I think, and we had the Summer of Love in, in 2000, was it? Yes. Uh, the Summer of Love where, uh, you know, three 300 cities or so were sacked in, in America. And this column was also published by Junger Freeheit, who said there was no, no better take than this, than this uh, column on the South African riots. And I actually said, um, like Alan Payton, it was time to uh, praise the beloved country, to use uh, Cry the Beloved Country, the, the uh, famous title by Alan Payton about South Africa, because whereas in America you saw men and women kneeling in, in embarrassingly homoerotic positions in front of their oppressors um, during these riots, in, in South Africa you had all factions come together, and it was, of course, wildly awful and terrible, but you had a moral stand. It was Butelezi, uh, Ramaphosa, and other, other individuals who came out together and said, we condemn these people. They were arresting left and right. Uh, they, the police were even killing um, these rioters. So there was a difference. So, you know, you're interviewing me 12, uh, 11, 12 years after writing this book, but I can say that we are there, and morally we are more, almost more rotten than South Africa.
And why why is that? Is that because the black South Africans were poorer and thus kind of more religious? and had certain sort of moral values, which meant that they condemned the violence? Or is that because South Africa was, for some strange reason, less polarised? Or what, what's the reason why why in, in South Africa the black leadership condemned behaviour like that, whereas in um, they didn't in America? It's inter- interesting, and I think um, it, it's a complicated question, but I think... Uh, Ed, that institutional rot is so pervasive in America. And in in fact, woke comes from America, it travels from America. I write in this book, the um, Anglo-American, there's a chapter called the Anglo-American Axis of Evil. And I explain how South Africa could have had a, a federated society with solutions for various groups. But America, who is which is based on on federalism, and it, it should be abhorrent of democracy. Insisted on one man, one vote. You know, uh, for South Africa. But it did. It did have a feder. It did have a federated society. It had the Bantu Stans, and it had That's the. That's right. The, but those, those are no longer because of the after democracy. Everyone was equally weighted. You had no fed, federalism. We had that under under the National Party, the National Apartheid, the um, much-condemned National Party. We did have a federated um, dispensation in South Africa, but America insisted on raw, what I call in the book, raw, ripe democracy. And so I would say you ask, you ask the question, why? Why uh, is America so morally rotten? I think the rot um, spread spread worldwide outwards and to South Africa. What what you see in South Africa today is a function of negotiations by, I think it was then uh, Bush senior or or, um, before him, was it Reagan? Um, His administration that insisted on what we see in South Africa. So all this was negotiated under um, under the wings of the eagle, the American eagle. But I mean, in many ways, though, then the, the, the not condemning the violence, uh, that's more like what happened in Zimbabwe than in South Africa, that, that you, you, you have the, America is at a worse stage. I mean, uh, in, in Zimbabwe, you basically had state sanctioned violence, the state, the state, you had these people, the, the farm invaders with names like Hitler, Hoosey and, and whatever. Um, and, and and the state just turned a blind eye. The state basically said these people have a moral right because they are veterans of the Bush War to invade yep. these people's lands and beat them up and kill them. And we will just do nothing about it. And that's kind of what is, is implicitly said in America. It's kind of like these people have a moral right. It's almost like they have a right to smash stuff up. Exactly. Standards of morals have been inverted and the amoral, I have a nice definition of woke for you, spearheaded in America, the woke universe we know inhabit and inhabit aims reflexively as inverting reality, turning truth, morality, ethics and aesthetics on their heads down to every categorical imperative bequeathed by the ancients. The goal of woke coming from America is to make the world safe for ugly, evil, idle and aberrant. So I like this... that. She, uh, Alana, I should say, is very good at quotes. There was one of them about what was it? The idea that um, Heidi Klum should play, pay for plastic surgery for ugly people in order to bring about yes, beauty. <laughs> yes. yes, beauty distribution in this book. Yeah. Yes, that, that, but... I was those were good quotes. Um, those, but, mine, but... Mine. Um, those, those are mine, of course. So yes, um, yeah, but Ed, but but just to finish the thought, a very important. Um, what did you ask me? You asked me about. I'm saying, right? are you? Is America basically more like Zimbabwe in the early oh, 2000s? Very good point, and and I do bring Zimbabwe up. Not, I have all the inside story because you know what 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 strikes me is so sad about new South Africans is that they know nothing about us old South Africans. I mean, I corresponded. I'm such an old South African. I corresponded with uh, P. W. Borta's second wife, so. I'm sort of, I I know the culture, I know the dispensation. And, um, you know, they don't know many of the things that went before and and the ins and outs of apartheid. And what happened with, even with Mugabe, Mugabe was told, your your society will collapse. You you, uh, articulated and and, and, um, described uh, when the state already was doing the veterans bidding uh, in, in Zimbabwe, in Rhodesia. But Mugabe initially put special voting roles in parliament 
um, so as to appease what people, what his advisors told him, you have to keep your whites happy if you want the society to prosper. And initially he tried. Uh, it isn't that interesting. So he had a special voting for white minority interests. And he then knew, uh, he, he didn't want to make the mistake that uh, that was made yeah. in Uganda, which is that you 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 piss off the the productive component of the population. So he uh, by Idi Amin or whatever. So he, he and knew Rhodesia, that. And Rhodesia was more literate. I think it's the sixties and fifties than India. It was doing well. It was it was a, sort of a breadbasket. But um, you know the the, the demos the the uh, the people the, the yeah. mutants would have <laughs> mutants to quote you. Well, no, uh, I, don't, I don't know if I don't know if they're mutants. You could you could argue that well yeah if they're white perhaps. But no I mean, no I, no I think think black mutants. The blacks um, are operating in their own interests though in a way aren't they? The the the, the, the and that's another thing that's strange that there hasn't the, one of the things that Mugabe did fairly quickly was you have two obviously two big tribes in 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 Zimbabwe. And uh, the New Delhi and the the um, the other one, the Joseph and Como one, and and um, and he and the they one of them is a Mugabe's tribe massacred the other tribe, but you, you haven't had that in South Africa. I mean, you you did have the Zulus working with the whites against the interests yes. of the other. You did have that chief yes. Magaluta Butalazi. Yes. Um, but you, 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 there hasn't been a massacre, though, has there? There hasn't been internal strife. Why no, is that? Man, that's, that's interesting. I, I um, would say that America is so fractious. Uh, it, it, it used to be a bi essentially a biracial uh, America was born, well, not born, but born biracially, I guess, to, to, to blacks and whites. And South Africa, similarly, is a biracial country. And we knew each other. I know, know a little bit of Kosa. I know a little bit of Zulu. We knew how to communicate. We didn't have this influx of Im immigration to to stop the little bit of reconciliation that could be blacks and whites in South Africa know each other. Um, they're very much intertwined. And so I think you see less, less of a fractious society. However, it's interesting, you did see massacres when you had when, when the government opened the borders and you had blacks from the north coming in. And then you saw uh, the Kosa and the, the, the Zulu and, and the many, many other tribes begin massacring the foreigners. Yeah. Um, OK. And, and so but what what the that's um, the future of America. So what, what 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 is it you should as as a, as you are in a rainbow nation? Um, what, what is what what are the step? What do you first start noticing? So once once apartheid fell, uh, and once it you know, gradually it's a it's a, a, a Mandela in charge. What what are the changes on an everyday basis that you start noticing? You know things getting worse. Yeah. What are, the, what are the signs? Rainbow nation turns into a Rambo nation. I think. But I, what are the signs of ev everyday well, life? I mean, sign, the signs is in South Africa. In America, it's slower because you have. Uh, the majority is still, um, you know, uh, Caucasian. And so the transformation is slower. Your institutions rot. Uh, America now is not a merit-based society. That's why you see such pervasive institutional rot. It is entirely based on affirmative action and wokeness. Hiring, uh, you know, bridges are, are going to start. As you, you mentioned math the other day with Michelle Malkin, Math, more than objective, follows uh, the laws of nature. So when you adopt various permutations of nature, um, which, which are not natural, you, your, your formula, your bridges collapse. So America's institutions are uh, rotting, but slower because the majority minority um, dispensation is different. In South Africa, you had Minor, a, a very small uh, minority, six, six million uh, Caucasian, and about 40 million that is suddenly, um, you know, open to, to affirmative action and being promoted rapidly. So I think you see a very quick collapse in, in South Africa, an institutional collapse. So yes, you see, they made that into, they made, as I understand it, if I'm, correct if I'm wrong, they made it into a... You've frozen. Oh, yes, you haven't. Frozen. Okay, they made it into a law, didn't they? I, I don't think even Zimbabwe did that. That you that you had to have a certain yes. number of black in. That's right, and, and discrimination against whites, whereby uh, whites can't, um, you know, form more than a certain percentage of the payroll. So, whites have been very. Um, 
you know, creative and there's a there's an underground economy. But being a white man in South Africa is particularly difficult. And there is a cognitive stratification whereby um, you'll have um, blacks with, with high school um, diploma and whites with degrees fronting them, but not but the but the black person is actually the CEO. And then you have the the serfs, the cognitive serfs doing the hard work uh, behind the scenes. So institutionally, the collapse is, is much quicker because you have such a quick overnight transformation in, um, in, the, skill, in the skill level. Here mm -hmm. it's been slower, but it's quite rapid. And in fact, I've been surprised at how rapidly America is going to, going to pot. So what, what have you, I mean, if you can compare the two, I mean, you have quite an interesting perspective in the sense that you've lived in South Africa and you live in America. So what what, what are you, I once um, talked to a, 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 a former chaplain to the Queen and uh, and he told me that uh, in about 10 years ago, he, he had this sort of sense, this smell. And it was a, it was a sense memory. And he last, it, it was a smell that he last smelled when he was living in the Soviet Union in the 80s, doing a degree in Russian or something. Mm -hmm. and, and, he, and he had this smell again. And then he realised that, shit, that I'm having this experience because I'm seeing the same things, you know, Soviet Union. Interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and um, so I, I, I'm wondering, uh, what are you seeing now that is re reminding you of South Africa? Well, you see, when, when I live... When I left, the society was still functioning quite well, South Africa, even though, um, and of course, the West li lied continuously about South Africa, uh, you know, uh, transformation and, and uh, empowerment began under the National Party. Uh, various rights were restored, um, so on and so forth. So in 95 and with freedom with the release of mandela and the first election that was not when the transformations happened the national party had immense uh, tra uh, transfer of wealth to to um black society and upliftment upliftment in fact uh when i wrote the book um you know unemployment among blacks was uh, inching towards oh i don't know was it 50 percent or so when I left South Africa, it was 19%. So um, things were gradually, the, the, the apartheid or the National Party did things gradually. So certainly whatever people thought happened in 94 uh, with, with the so-called, uh, the democratic um, election was really a more gradual process. But so I didn't see the things that my friends and family are living through now regularly rolling blackouts. Now you try living when six hours a day you don't have electricity. Um, you can't, uh, you can't, it's very difficult to defend yourself. Um, you know, police was very efficient. South African police was very efficient. I mean, there's a wonderful description, I think, in the book. Um, I think it's based on the book by Out of Africa, a black journalist who's never interviewed. He was Washington Post's, um, you know, he, uh, he was the head of the Washington Post's desk in, in Africa. And he said what amazed him. Of course, he was pro-Mandela, pro-democracy, which my book comes out against, pro-mass society. But he said what amazed him is when there was a Zulu and Kosa massacre, you saw these white men with the rud ruddy cheeks. They'd come and they'd put the yellow tape around the scene and then and they'd um, go ahead and do the forensics. So... Police was very efficient. Conviction rates were, were quite good. Um, you know, uh, we had the death penalty. So if there was, if there were violent massacres against farmers, the culp uh, the culprit was was uh, I have a de I describe this in the book. The culprit was caught. The family um, brought to the gallows, and everyone made to watch. Good deterrent. Interesting. Mm. There's a description in the book. Um, You've read the book more recently than I have. I wasn't aware that we got well, yeah, it. You wrote the book, so I would have thought it would be more. I know, I haven't read it, but, but uh, my memory. I, 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 I remember that uh, uh, one of the things that I, with, with regard to democracy in, in Africa, um, they, they have the African, the black African upper class uh, have, in my experience, quite interesting views on this. And I found it again and again uh, with those that I know that they are opposed to it. 
and and the more the more ba the more kind of based ones. Well, I mean, I was talking for, uh, some years ago to some people from um, uh, what's that place called that speaks French that's next to Nigeria. Uh, uh, oh Christ! Anyway, um, the, so, Cameroon, Cameroon, Cameroon. Um, uh, uh, some people from Cameroon, and they they were saying to me that no, we he, he was quite open about it. He said, "Yeah, I agree with you. We have an average IQ of seventy or whatever, and you you must understand that we have lots of people in my country that believe in ghosts and witches and whatever. Give these people the vote, and we're completely screwed." No, no, no way. We can't have democracy in Cameroon. It would be terrible. Um, and and um. And and that that and I've, I've spoken to people from Nigeria that I live with a Nigerian. He was of the same again Nigerian sort of upper class um, Yoruba, and he was saying the same thing that no 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 you can't we can't. And they also felt that we could learn from them, which I thought was interesting. Like I was in a, I was with a Nigerian friend in England in 2011. I think it was 2011 during these riots. These riots, literal like there was these riots in London in 2011, and he was living in uh, Hackney. And with the center of the riots, and I was there in his flat while there was like, like things going past the window, police helicopters, God knows what. And he yeah. was saying to me, Ed, in Nigeria, if they did this, then the police would come out and they would start shooting, and they would not stop shooting until these people learn to behave themselves. And 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 I, you know, I kind of respected that. I was like, yeah, that's base. Well, that's, that's pretty weak. Well, um, one of the columns I wrote after the book, uh, there was a, a a big mining strike. And uh, the police, uh, by then it was uh, predominantly black, came and shot down. Um, there was a beginning of a riot, and it's a very scary thing when you start when we when you start seeing the people uh, become riled up. I mean, you had American woman torn to pieces because she went there to spread love. I think you might remember. I don't remember her name. I have that in the book. An American young woman gone to bring love to the natives. They tore her to pieces. Um, literally, limb to limb, um, limb from limb. But so we had this um, a while ago, I think it was about nine or eight years ago, there was a mining strike and the police came and and, um, and I said, well, this is what this is what you do and this is how you control it. And of course, America was dead set against any police control. So already there, Ed, you get the difference between um, the African attitude and uh, the, the Western attitude about Africa. The Western attitude about Africa. And interesting, I go deeply into the Zulu um, kingdom. Uh, was it Sesquaya? Uh, I can't remember the, uh, the the chief who came after Dingan. I might be mispronouncing. As I say, I'm not. Uh, I can't remember my own book. But you know, the the the, the British Empire destroyed the Zulu uh, kingdom, right? And mm -hmm. exiled him to very sad. Exiled him, and it was over a very petty thing whereby he ex executed some criminals. And the British decide, oh, this is not democratic. This is terrible. This is evil. It was he did justice, and he wrote the most beautifully poignant letter. And I think uh, I mentioned it in the book. It's a very uh, wide ranging book, um, which is like I I'm interested in a lot of things. So I don't know if it's a mishmash, but I I, uh, I think the book reflects that. But anyhow, uh, Sitchquaya wrote this to the British um, uh, person in control, and he said, uh, I don't interfere in your democracy. Leave me to govern my people. And he said, my people need killing occasionally. <laughs> so that was his p delightful way of saying in order to, to keep the Zulu Empire, the Kral, um, under control, I have to make an example. We don't yes. like to accept it, but I mean, that I was. Think, I think this is one of the things that you, you don't you get in America. One of the things that's noticed in America is black people are really into beating their kids. Yeah. And uh, yeah, yeah. And I, I did a paper on this um, with my colleague Guy Madison in this the, med the journal Medical Hypotheses. Um, what we found, we look at, look at the data, is that corporal punishment, um, mm -hmm. if administered in very specific ways, has positive outcomes, one. Corporal punishment has very positive outcomes among white people that are Christians, to the extent that it's, you know, they really do need to be beaten, white people that are Christians, two. And three, among blacks in particular, the more that their parents basically thrash them, uh, the more positive outcomes they have. Um, and and we we looked at the, we did it, and this is very you know this is like uh, you get all these people say oh corporal punishment has negative outcomes no it doesn't it has negative outcomes in the sense that people that are crazy will be more likely to beat their kids and then those kids will be yeah. crazy independent of what happens to them 
that's the, you've got to control for the mentalness exactly um, and, and when you do yeah. that then it, and among blacks particularly and whites so my attitude is that let black people bring up their children as they think fit they know how to do that um and and uh, this is this is a, 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 an issue of contention uh in the in the yes. research but yeah so if we move on to something else which is the, the one one thing of uh, speaking of of dysgenics and, and stuff like this that we have we have uh, Can I just interject about. about the French fries murder? I thought it was interesting. You made a comment. I think you and Michelle were discussing uh, a society of affluence where um, where uh, this gentleman killed someone who delivered he, to his mother um, lukewarm French fries. But I would think it's also low inhibitions. And those low inhibitions, because I wouldn't say that uh, this gentleman necessarily would be, you know, the, the, the gentleman who shot in the head, the, the yeah. uh, fast food... So I don't think it's a function of affluence and impatience. I think that is more a Western perspective, raping uh, that reality. I think it's a function of low inhibitions. You have to have gratification now. That, I mean, the gentleman who did the shooting might have been very poor. And also what's happened, these low inhibitions and the atavistic, um, um, you know, some dog society has been institutionalized in America. We see, we glorify that, and we've elevated um, this kind of uh, behavior. So I think that, that you make a good yeah, point. Yeah, uh, well, they, they do. They do on average. They they do have poor inhibition. That's uh, that's that's true because it's an adapt. It's an be, being impulsive is an adaptation to an unstable, dangerous ecology, and that is the ecology of, of well, not South Africa, but of Central Africa. Um, of course, but a lot of people don't realise that the Afrikaans have been in South Africa longer than the blacks. Yes, yes. In many cases, they don't they don't understand that South Africa was Bushmen, Bushmen, and the 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 and the, the Bushmen again the cores are a kind of fifty percent Bushmen or sixty percent Bushmen. That's why that's why uh, Nelson Mandela, who is a cause of prince, uh, doesn't look very very black. Uh, but they, they're a different race, people. The, the Bushmen yes. are, are, are the ones that I've discussed this on the channel before, with the big bottoms and the big vaginas. Yes. Um, but, 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 well, they have these, they have these uh, um, minor labia that extend uh, down about two inches, three inches between their legs, and they do little dances for the men with, with them. It's very interesting. And they so adhere together like, like, a banana, <laughs> like, a, like a banana skin. If you read my book, Making Sense of Race, I actually have a picture of, 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 of the... I, have, I avoided your uh, video about the big O because I, I didn't want to know what you had to say about that. The, the big O? What was that? Oh, the orgasm. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I don't know. I forget what that well, yeah, it was. To do with, it was to do with differences of how easily ladies... Lady, Ed Decorum is saying Luther Berg. Yes, I'm terribly sorry. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm so awfully... I'm, I'm frankly sorry. In front of a lady as well. Yes, indeed. Um, okay, yes. But we're going to move on, though. I want to move on to the, to the issue of a, a, abortion. Now, um, uh, you, you and Ed's unhealthy fixation. It's not unhealthy. It's fascinating. Um, but, um, the Bushman. I've never met a Bushman oh, in real life. No, but I wanted to ask you, Ed, because you can enlighten me. I, we, and I know them as much gentler than the Court and the Zulu and the Ndebi, um, they are a, a tracking and a hunter-gatherer uh, people, and they are gentle, the Bushman, as compared to the African. Yeah. Uh, quite a sweet people, and they are responsible for the beautiful um, rock croppings. Mm. Uh, you know, the rock, so they are different people. Um, a different race, yeah. And, and they, quite gentle. And the, the, they're so they're so so the the, the the genetic difference between one Bushman tribe and another can be as big as between a European person and like a. a they're Japanese. almost extinct because the Kalahari, you know, it's huge. It's, but they're they're fascinating because uh, of course they're from further cold. they're from further south. It's colder, so but they're, the, they're, they're interesting between our Native Americans, the Indian, the Native Indians, the Mary Indians. And the Bushmen, because they have also fallen into extinction and into drunkenness, and and certainly um, I'm very sympathetic to Amerindians, uh, Indians, not to the plight of the African Americans, whom I think are have a, a extractive uh, view of politics and use um, so-called grievance, which they don't really have much grievance to rely on. But certainly the Ameri uh, Indians and the Bushmen in, in parallel in South Africa. Do have um, do have a case for grievance because they were actually. You see, this, is my, this is my book. So look, this is what no, they're. Don't show me any rude, rude quote. Please, you're, you're trying then, to embarrass me. I, you're a sadist. And, 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 <laughs> 
Yeah, but 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 one one of the things that's interesting about the Bushmen is that they they recognise their difference. So they have they have the well, I've written it here somewhere. There's these three words they have, and one is the word for um I can't do the clicks. I can't do the clicks. But but basically, yeah. exclamation mark a meat. So that's animals that are dangerous to them. Uh, so that's the, sorry, that's things they can eat. And there's animals that are dangerous to them. Uh, and that 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 is uh, that is lions, hyenas, Europeans, uh, blacks. And then there's loma, which is incredible animals. Sorry, which is sorry, sorry, I'm getting this wrong. Um, so there's an, there's animals they can eat. There's animals that are dangerous to them, and there's there's them, and then there's the, the word for them is zoo, and mm -hmm. th they call they call um, uh, dangerous animals animals that are dangerous to them. That's Europe. That's the hyenas, lions, Europeans, blacks. That's one particular word, um, and then zoo. That's them. That's what they are. They're zoo. And when Japanese anthropologists have gone there, they call them zoo. So they, they recognize that they look a bit like each other, you see. It's interesting that it's their cate categorization skills are not too advanced. <laughs> Animal and human. No, no. <laughs> but they, but they, but they, yeah, that's, it's quite an interesting thing. But I wanted to get on to Ed, I, I, I think Ed, I might. By the, way, the, the Bushmen were quite victor. Uh, in many cases, victims, they were, I think I bring this up in the book too, uh, both the black uh, tribes and Afrikaners would hunt them for fun because they are comical and they're quite gentle and they run. Uh, so they would have be, be hunting them on horseback for fun. Quite sad, I think. Yes, and if, even with, in the Congo with the pygmies, in, in, in particular, even worse. The, pyg the pygmies are these nice, pleasant little little people. And they the um, the Bantu... Uh, hunt them for you know for meat basically. They just see them as kind of monkeys. Um, it's 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 very sad. But we heard some sound that Southern Africa is the is the place of the Bushmen. Uh, until a thousand years ago or two thousand years ago, it was totally Bushmen. Uh, and then the Zulu, um, the Bantu started to move Same south. Down. But they're very yeah. they're ve they're very different psychologically. Um, they're uh, they're kind of childlike. Uh, yes. And and uh, and and no, no and nobody seems to care about what happens to them. But it's there. No, and, it's and there. Good, South Southern good Africa. Point, a good point because uh, restoring land, and you know now you have the whole racket. You see the racket of um, reparations here, and I compare that in the book to the the racket of rep we we will see the racket of reparations already ramping up. But in South Africa, you have a whole industry of reparations. You have fake people conglomerating, uh, going to uh, starting to squat on land. They create reality on the ground. They kill a few people. They torture animals in the most awful way. And there's even there's even a chapter about the the brutality visited on animals. They they slice the Achilles Achilles heel so the animal just dies on the spot. And so they create a reality on the ground, and then they go to the, the, the courts and they get the property. So um, it's interesting that the, the, the Bushman is so ineffective and so marginalized, much like the American Indian, that they couldn't even get their, um, you know, their, their swathes of the desert uh, legally bequeathed to them in the new South Africa. No, um, and I, I mean in in Namibia they're looked after. Well, even in Namibia they're put on they're put on these these reserve. They've been, all been moved in Namibia onto reservations now. And what and what happened? But the 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 Bushmen and the pure Bushmen, and then of course you've got the the um the hot and top the koi koi, who mm -hmm. are about ten percent black, who are who are a bit different, but basically a similar kind of thing. And and they've put them on these reservations, and then irresponsible black people sell them alcohol and stuff, and they're just drinking themselves to death. Because they have they have no resistance whatsoever, um, it's it's pretty it's terrible. But we've got use a psych as a as a um, evolutionary psychologist. What do you see between uh, the difference between the Bushman and the Koi, and uh, similarly the Native American here and the Black in the in the one the, the 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 Black person has an extractive view of politics, really knows how to wield and and use politics to his advantage. The other doesn't. What do you make of that? Well, I mean, black people are more intelligent than Bushmen and Koi, um, clearly. And Native um, Americans? No, Native Americans don't have... No, not um, Native Americans. Native American average IQ is 86. Um, uh, oh. The black average IQ in Africa is 70. The Bushman average IQ is about 55. Yeah. Um, uh, so they're not very they're not very intelligent, Bushmen. So I think that's, so that's a big thing. Um, and they're, they're evolved to an environment which is a kind of, in a way, 
less harsh, less less necessary to be impulsive, less violent. It's a less violent <laughs> environment. So they're less impulsive, they're less aggressive. Um, and uh, and they've never taken up farming, which reduces the IQ, whereas most of the blacks have taken up farming. Oh. So I think that's uh, that's a big part of it. And as for the Native Americans, you, you've got to some extent a kind of East Asian mindset. They are yeah. um, related closely to the East Asians. Yeah. So this so makes them... First, I don't know. Eh? Yeah. Sort of yeah. less aggressive. Maybe. Yeah, but they're still there. Yeah, yes, but they're still they've got this kind of cooperativeness and 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 stuff, and so it just makes them less aggressive. It's it's terribly sad because it's their country. I haven't been to Africa, but I've been to uh, Navajo land, Navajo Nation in in America, and it's um it, it's around the Grand Canyon, and it's awful. It's like they're just yeah, living yeah. in these little these little trailer trailers, uh, and uh, selling a kind of comical. Um, version of their culture, but on tables by the side of the road where they sell dream catchers and and, and things like that, just these little trinkets. Uh, and uh, um, it's just it's so depressed, uh, mm. and they're, and they're so out of touch with anything. And they live on the, these reservations, and, the, and you can't bring alcohol into the reservations by law. Um, oh, but, but, of course, but of course, they get hold of it somehow, you know, in various ways. Because it's not like there's a border check when you go into these into these areas. It's just like a road. But, but isn't um, it interesting that that uh, you and I are critical of uh, conservative conservatism? How um, conservatives who genuflect to blacks. Uh, every single perspective of a conservative is how you know. Uh, Critical race theory, oh, it's unfair to blacks because talented blacks, uh, bl you know the whole argument, right? It's always, it's never that critical race theory is anti-white, period. Oh, it's unfair, it, 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 dis it disenfranchises black because, because blacks should be uh, promoted based on merit, all this crap. I can't even follow the contours of the conservative argument. But they are very hateful against, the, the, the perennial piñata is the Native uh, American. Isn't that interesting? Um, whereby conservatism genuflects to the black culture. Have you noticed that? I, I must say I, I'm not familiar with, with them having a problem with it. I didn't know that. Um, oh, well, what but, about yeah. Columba, uh, Columbus Day? Oh, we must. Uh, they cannot understand that it might be a wee bit sensitive, you know. So you have these uh, tired, hackneyed, op-eds always written about around columbus day you know we must no, I, 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 I see what you mean well i guess the the native americans are such a small percentage of the population and they're so no, irrelevant yeah yeah the, the, from, a, from a sort of machiavellian perspective um why bother really i mean i was in mexico city a, uh, a couple of months ago and they torn down the columbus statue there uh and you you have a um uh, a growth in grieve sort of Native American grievance politics, basically. But it always in, goes in, nowhere. It goes nowhere in the U.S. But it, it will do in it will do in South. It has done in South America, in Ecuador, and and whatever. Uh, mm. But 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 it's um, no, it's ter it's terrible what's happening. It, what, what's happening to me? Um, I, we haven't. I, we're going to speak briefly about the issue of abortion. Oh yes, yes. So, so um, I, I, I have a lot of my followers are anti-abortion. Yes, and I said, too. I call them said, monster. Look, a monster. I'm a monster of a griper like. Right, but I'm saying here's the situation: Who has abortion? Spiteful mutants. What will spiteful mutants give birth to? Spiteful mutants, okay. um, and, and also stupid people. And what will they give birth to? Stupid people. So, isn't it basically slowing down the collapse? And it has slowed. I think it probably has. It definitely has reduced crime in America. There was a study yes. by some. Uh, yes, I sent has, it. I sent it to you. Yeah. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it, you, we would be in a much worse state if we hadn't had abortion for the, in America since the 70s. So, exactly. Uh, why, why are they against it, do you think? What, I don't really understand. The study was uh, Donahue and Levitt, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's right. It showed an a appreciable uh, reduction after abortion in the 70s appreciable reduction in crime because the majority abortions, I think 55% or so, are among blacks, right? Um, mm. So you're looking at the utilitarian perspective, um, and I definitely, as a, as a libertarian, I look at the principle, you know, you can huff and puff about how terrible it is and how evil it is, et cetera, et cetera. 
but essentially it's your fucking body, right? I mean, how are you in a free society going to control the body of another? In addition to saying women are the same as men, are free, I, I am all for making a principled argument why women and men are totally different, therefore a woman shouldn't have control over her body. I would disagree with it maybe at some point, but make that argument. But what conservatives do is, oh, you're free and you're wonderful and you need to love babies, but you can't do what you may with your own uterus. Um, so that's one, one argument. You either all rights issue from self-ownership. How can you own property if you don't, don't bloody well own yourself? Yeah. Uh, and, and so all rights issue from self-ownership, at least in... in so that's, that's presumably why women shouldn't be allowed to own property. I mean, that's what was the case in Sark, like, one of the Channel Islands, until yeah. quite recently, women couldn't own property. And that's presumably and why. And also, um, well, you mentioned blacks and voting. You know, initially in the Cape, voting was based on, before apartheid, the vote, voting was, and that's also in the book, voting was based on uh, property, if you were a property owner, and many blacks and coloreds were property owners and were given the vote in the Cape. The same thing with the founding fathers here, propertarian principle. If you are a property owner, um, that gives you some say in the polity. So, yeah. So if, you're, if, you're, if you're paying tax, then you should have a say in how your tax is spent, and so therefore you should be allowed to have uh, elect people more than that because that. if you own property if you more than paying tax because i guess we could claim i guess well maybe 50 percent of americans don't pay tax tax so, so you're probably right in saying of them don't pay tax i think the lower the lower um i might be wrong about that but i think um definitely people who, who earn below a certain uh, amount don't pay taxes. You know, the highest earners pay the most tax. No, yeah, yeah. But I mean, if you don't pay tax, you're, you're, just, you're, not, you're not contributing anything to the society. Exactly. Your point is exactly correct. You should not have a lien on the property of somebody else, should you? No, I mean, the, the clarion call of the, of the American Revolution was no taxation without representation. Mm -hmm. so, so surely it follows no representation without taxation. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's a reasonable. As, back to women, I certainly, I think it was 2005 when I said that I'd give up my vote as a woman if all women were denied the vote, <laughs> because I think we'd have a freer society, a fairer society. But I think we've we've passed that point. So the first abortion would be based on on uh, your ownership of your own body. However mutant and however ever abhorrent these women are, they they do own uh, that real estate. I don't think anyone else wants to. Um, I'm surprised they have an issue. I don't, any any man who gets on top of that putrid flesh and has his jollies. <laughs> yeah, is, I mean, they're bound, they're bound, they've got to be thinking of somebody else or, or, or whatever. I mean, I don't Protection. know how you can. Projection. So self ownership is definitely a, a perspective. But however, with the, with the issue with the abortion is is also people who don't want to uh, pay for it have rights. So the fact that it's repaired or, or gone back to the states, the state level, doesn't really solve that question for conservatives who simply, I've always believed conservatives that they just don't want to pay for this abhorrent uh, procedure, but it transpires they really don't want abortion. They want to outlaw. And that was a surprise, wasn't it, to you? It is it's ridiculous. Yeah, it wasn't a surprise to me because I know these people, but they, 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 they want to stop. They have this idea of almost... A, a almost anti-scientific idea of of disembodied souls that <laughs> enter enter random into bodies. It's all like there, for the grace of God, go I. Yes. yes. And, and and if these children could just know Christ, then they'd be jolly good chaps. Yes. And there'd be no, yes. They, they wouldn't commit. And you're like, no, that's not the case. Uh, they, these these people are. It's these the traits are highly heritable. At least fifty percent heritable. These kids are going to grow up. To be violent criminals or weirdos or whatever, so it's good that they that the mothers have bought them. Um, it, it definitely is. Don't you think? Uh, what, but, about, what about the perspective of Christianity? I mean, Christianity also plays into woke, I believe, in that it's a missionary. Uh, it has a missionary man mandate, unlike Judaism and Islam. It's not parochial. It's not. Um, it doesn't. It's not about your tribe, it is global, it's, paro it, it's not parochial, and it, it looks at, it fetishizes the other. 
So this plays into work, I mean, in, in, in why you can absolutely forfeit yourself, turn the other cheek, and for the other, that, that's wokeism, isn't it? I mean, this absolute fetishization of, of uh, it fetishizes the, other. the weak, the weak, the weak. Exactly, exactly. And this is um, what um, you, I mean, you, you, you get that in you get that in in Judaism though, don't you? You 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 fetishize the the second son, you know, the the person that comes second. Is is, is is very. I mean, all your where are all your Jewy comments? All your anti-Semitic will remind you that it's all about. Oh, no, you'll get them. You'll, you'll, well, they've been called. They've been calling you an elf and things. So yeah, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll you'll um you'll 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 elf elf is a word for Jew. It means Jew. Well, um, okay, you're not familiar with this stuff, no. Okay, look, we're about halfway through. So I just like to say, uh, hello, to anyone that's new to the Jolly Heretic, hello, 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 welcome to Jolly Heretic. We are, of course, online public house that meets on Mondays and Thursdays at 7 p.m. UK time, 2 p.m. New York, in which we discuss base science and base research of all kinds, which is increasingly expansion from our woke joke universities. Um, and normally on Mondays, it's me on my own answering your various intelligent questions. And on Thursdays, I have a very interesting guest. And that guest today is the South African uh, writer, uh, Ilana Mercer. And we've been talking about South Africa, the collapse of civilization and uh, abortion. Um, I should emphasize that we've, we've just, uh, we have a poet here at the Jolly Heretic Public House, um, uh, Mr. Andrew Quinn, and he's written a poem for tonight's occasion. Our guest here tonight, uh, sorry, our guest here tonight on the spot penned into the cannibal's pot. A riveting <laughs> read on a state gone to seed. I'm sure she will teach us a lot. Oh, so thank brilliant. You, thank you, Mr. Yeah, Mr. Love Quinn, that for your... Um, your, your poem um, for, for, for today's uh, uh, today's occasion. So I'm, I'm now going to turn to some of the questions that have been um, sent in for Ilana. Uh, if you have any questions for Ilana, you can, of course, send them in on YouTube or Entropy, um, indicating that they're for her, and we will answer them today. So first of all, then, we have a question from I am, the person was I am stupid. Uh, hey, Ilana, can you explain your beef with Kevin McDonald? I don't have one. Um, do I? Well, apparently, oh, you've, you've criticised his idea that, that Jewish people oh, were heavily represented in left movements or something. I suppose. Oh, I, I had the feeling this was long ago. We're friends on, and, and we definitely email. So, I, I, to me, intellectual disagreement should never uh, lead. I don't know why people conflate how people unfollow you. I can follow anyone. How people conflate intellectual disagreement with. Um, you know, being an enemy. I, I'm friends with him, and I certainly email with him, and uh, we're friends on Twitter. Um, no, I think it's, this goes back a long time. I think I once had the feeling as as a Jew that he had never met Jews because he mentions things like uh, weak women subjugated to the patriarch. Has he met uh, the, what what Woody Allen called the castrating Zionist? <laughs> I. I uh, so I just had the feeling that he 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 was more um, he had abstracted the whole concept of of um, Jewish family, Jewish marriage, and so on. No yeah, enemy, uh, no enemies uh, with him. I was very disappointed in uh, Durham University Jewish Society uh, when I was there. That I was invited to a kosher meal, which I thought would be interesting. <laughs> it, it was just it was just pasta. Because pasta is kosher. Oh, oh, okay. No, I wanted like specifically kosher meat or whatever, you know. But no, no, that was that was that was very boring. Um, one thing you did get when you, if you were in Durham University Jewish Society, was a Jew bag. They gave you a bag with a with a Star of David on it, with like goodies in it. A Jew bag, which <laughs> a Jew bag is an insult in the UK. If someone's mean, you say they're a Jew. What bag. was in it? What was in it? Oh, uh, there was a little shot glass with a Star of David, with a with one of those candle hole things, whatever it is you call them, on it. And there was a copy of the, uh, some Jewish book or something, Torah, I don't know what it was, um, and uh, some Hebrew writing. And yeah, you know, it, the, This might interest you also about me. I, you know, I come from there. My father was a rabbi and so on, and I never got into that. I just never felt part of the tribe. And I have realized I have such an affinity for the Hebrew Testament. I never called it old because it's not old. And I know it and I speak it and I, I can analyze it. And I realized that, like Alexander Yanai, you know, that wicked king, um, you know, well before Christ, I'm a Hebrew. I'm not so much a Talmudic Jew, but I'm a Hebrew. You're an Israelite. They were, they were nationalists. They felt that they, that, you know, they defended themselves. They, I don't know, they, they seem much more less, uh, less uh, deracinated and disembodied than, than uh, dias diaspora Jews. 
And that's why Israel seemed to me a very uh, good thing, but it's gone the way of America. When I was growing up, Israel was not American in the least. It was, a, it was, people point out to it being too socialist, and of course it was heavily socialized, but um, society-wise it was, it would interest you because you often speak about moving from England to Norway because you thought there'd be more mm. community. But we grew up in 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 a wonderful in a in a, a small, um, almost the Burkean little platoon society in Israel. Now it's become Americanized, woke, globalist. It's not the Israel I grew up in. So I'm a Hebrew. Oh. I look at myself as a Hebrew. Do, do, do they speak English more than they used to? I don't know. When I left, uh, Hebrew was. Uh, I learned, uh, uh, I speak a very high Hebrew. Now I hear it's literally pigeon Hebrew, I would call it. You know, it's, it's as ugly as American, like, 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 you know, this awful American. The best adjective that American people who call themselves editors is incredibly blessed, you know, incredibly is the best adjective. But Hebrew was spoken beautifully. I mean, on television, the announcers could only speak what we call Yerushalmic Hebrew. In other words, you'd have to roll the tongue like you would, um, not guttural. You'd, you'd, you'd roll the R's and, and speak a high Hebrew. And, of course, my nightmares uh, in academia come from my matriculation because we did something like a baccalaureate. Our matriculation in Israel was absolutely impossible. And just the the, the, the Hebrew literature and grammar that we had to learn was... was uh, was onerous. So I think they've gone the way of America. Books, you cannot read in uh, Hebrew literature, much like you can't read modern American literature. Um, I mean, when I mean modern, I mean nowadays. You, you can read from, I read books in Hebrew from the 50s, like Agnon and those kind of um, brilliant writers. But if you read uh, current writers, it's just not Hebrew. It's trash. It's disgusting. And for someone who, who prizes language, including Hebrew, um, I see Israel as a sort of mini America now. Uh, right, yeah, yeah. I mean, I started learning biblical Hebrew uh, oh. as a theology degree, um, which is different, a kind of handwriting style from the Hebrew yes. that you have now. Uh, and um, uh, yeah, that was hard work. Oh, it's, it's, no, it's not. Once you learn the once you learn the script, once you've got the script sourced, it actually it's not that complicated. It's shit hot writers. The biblical writers are shit hot writer. I the, mean, they, the, they, uh, can really, they can really write good text. Okay, next question comes from uh, the same person. It says, hey, Alana, couldn't everyone foresee what would happen to South Africa after apartheid fell? It was clearly going to follow the same trajectory as Zimbabwe. Yes, and local leaders tried to warn it. There was um, uh, General Filion, I think it was. Um, what, what I go into the book is how they, they didn't have to cede power. South Africa had a mighty military. Um, General Filion said to his... Um, underling he said you and i i quote it's quite sad how the white man the just relinquishes control i think i call it the pathos and the paradox of the wasp he said to his underling he said we can take this country in a day and he said but but, but then we'd have to face the world so <laughs> there you have the consideration of um there were so many interests and so many negotiations going. Butelezi was powerful. He wanted a federated, a, a, an independent KwaZulu-Natal. America would not have it. The New York Times bad-mouthed Butelezi as a bad actor. He's a free market, classical liberal, highly intelligent man. America and England, the Anglo-American axis of evil, saw to it that South Africa went the way of uh, Zimbabwe. And I lay there. Right. Exactly. So that's who you blame. The same people who export democracy uh, to Iraq and uh, destroyed those countries and Libya, etc., destroyed South Africa. They, they, they don't understand that you can't have their democracy everywhere. And in fact, you can't really have democracy now in America because about half of the population don't accept the legitimacy of the other half of the population. So and even they, in America, they don't, they don't accept that you can't impose ideas from above. These have to grow slowly from the, from the soil upwards. And well, they, don't, they, don't, they, don't, they don't accept that some peoples, let's say the Russians, they just don't like, aren't used to and don't want democracy. They think it's a stupid idea. And it's not inherently a good idea. It's not inherently a good idea to give everybody, the, if you've got a certain level of intelligence, then maybe give it at a certain level of, of, of mutual love and bonding for each other, then perhaps you can have universal suffrage. But if you haven't got that, then it's... Um, 
or a very small spot like um, uh, Estonia or Athens, you know, a very small uh, Luxembourg. I don't know, maybe yeah, if people you... are all closely related, and so it's exactly. like a big family. But exactly. it's much more difficult once it's massive. So, so they can't. I mean, and they didn't even at the height of American democracy in the sixties or fifties. They didn't control the South. The South basically did what it wanted uh, until uh, the sixties. So it doesn't. Um, no, not good. Right. Next question comes from the same person. It says, "Hey, Alana, were the majority of Jews in South Africa pro-apartheid? They were classified as white and and gained from the system." You know. Um... What what biases people, and uh, certainly my father was anti-apartheid and, and an activist, and I get a lot of flack for that. And um, I do have a chapter in, in which I speak to his views, which which he based in in, um, in 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 Bible. But most Jews were very conservative, and they were National uh, Party supporters. I think what you saw was so many Jews were at the top of the um, ANC hierarchy, that that certainly turned people uh, against Jewry. And I, and I can't deny that that um, some of the most destructive people were at the top of the ANC, as, including Indians as well. Um, but the, the Jews that I, that I uh, knew and grew up with were, were very comfortable with their maids and their um, security and, and has, it, has it got to a point now i mean you you don't live there but you keep in touch with these people uh, there's there's a distinction uh, one could between you know de jure power and de facto power and in de jure power it's that is that yeah in theory that the government of india controls india but in practice in the countryside it doesn't really uh, and and it's basically bandit territory in some areas of, of India, um, and I wondered, is this what's going on now in South Africa? That that there's just basically areas where the whites have appointed basically protection rackets, and that those are essentially the government of a certain or Indians. I got the impression that during the riots that you had, yes. uh, was it last year? Or, or, uh, I, I got the impression that that's what's kind of what's going on. The police are ineffective. They're all, useless uh the corruption. so you've just got in the, the, in the book i cite that there are four hundred thousand. in then this was years ago four hundred thousand private uh private security uh, people and some of them guard the police <laughs> so uh, some of them protect the police the police is inept and police and military were very effective in, in old south africa and of course we had the um uh, various rules that, that 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 you know workers had to go back to their um, townships, awful places, but so so uh, urban areas were, were quite safe. You know, as as a nineteen year old, I remember once um, getting lost in my little uh, mini and stopping at, at two in the morning to ask someone for directions. I and mean, you couldn't do that today. So, are there uh, areas of uh, of autonomy? You know, I don't have um, the people that I know don't don't are not quite able to conceptualize and speak. To these issues when I ask them, but I think um, that there are private private security is 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 uh, very robust, and people all have um, you know barbed wires and security systems, and people who do come. Um, what happens when you shoot someone? I don't know. When I researched for my book, it was you had better not be caught defending yourself, just much like in the U.S. Um, you, you defend yourself. You might have a Second Amendment, but you defend yourself at your own peril. You know. Um, yeah. When, when I when I got my my thirty eight special when I was a young woman and I got my thirty eight special and we went to the local police station to get me my um, my uh, license. He said to me, um, Macy, that's a young lady. Please remember, if you shoot someone, and this is apartheid South Africa, we're going to have to come and arrest you if you shoot someone in an unjustified way. And in his thick accent, he said, remember, Macy, to drag him in the house first, and then we'll come and do the forensics. <laughs> so he was telling me how I would be able to get away with defending myself. Good, that's good, uh, good, good advice. Uh, next question is, hey, Alana, what is your view of the ADL and other liberal Jewish organizations in the U.S.? What's the question? I hate them. I'm on the Southern Poverty Law Center. Um, they lie about me. Uh, the ADL doesn't. Um, as an, I don't. I don't know uh, that they've said anything about me. But I'm sure I'm, I'm 
not very popular. They're horrible people. Southern Poverty Law, also run by prominent Jews. I am on their list of uh, persona non grata racists. And then they have they have the most, in fact, I must write a column because I've assembled, does it happen to you? You assemble so much material and you just never get to it. Um, I assembled all the lies. They accused me of um, being on the panel with Richard Spencer. And in fact, I wasn't invited to the Mencken um, colloquial they just lie all the time. And then they said, look how racist her website is. And she used, and they showcased my website beautifully. I was so happy with it. It was the best of all my, um, the nav bar. And then they said, and, it, and the way she speaks, and they showcased so one of that, my best turns of phrases was, I likened the, the burqa or the abaya to a nose bag. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was, a, it was rather funny and they, they bad-mouthed me about that. So they did a really good um, expose of me in some article. But no, I hate them. I hate them. Understandably, yes, I hate them. The kindest thing one can wish such people is an early death. Um, okay, the next question comes from the same person. says, hey, Alana, are there any other books on South Africa we, you suggest we read? I'm not sure I can read yours because it's too depressing. Oh, well. It's funny. It's funny, but but I certainly relied on many sources. My friend Dan Root, you should you should you should have him on. He recommended. I you know I always I think you're an a, an honest intellectual Ed too, and I I, I prize myself on that. Always acknowledge people who have helped me along the way. Uh, Dan Root recommended magnificent sources, the Africana by Herman Guillaume, and one of those. Um, YouTube sensations. I think it was Stefan Molyneux suddenly came up with that, with that secondary source, quite without crediting my book. Of course, it comes from my book, but Herman Guillaume, the Africana, is fascinating by a liberal, by a liberal academic. I use that. Um, the White Tribe of Africa, wonderful, but these are difficult to get. So you will have to read my book because I you have saw. To, yeah. I, I once, yes. I once, I once chatted with Dan Root on a on a different channel. Um, yeah. Uh, years ago on somebody else's channel i once chatted away with dan root uh I, and then i emailed him and asked him to come on he never got back to me but oh, uh, yeah I, so I, 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 he's uh he's he's writing is better than dan forgive me his writing is much better than he's speaking but he's a very intelligent uh quite brilliant man yeah okay so then we get so the, okay the next question comes from uh oh christ okay here we go yes so we did that one. Oh god i'm gonna move up hang on there we go uh da, 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 uh Oh, thoughts on oh sorry yes um uh yes so ryan thompson says um thoughts on jewish subversion of south africa diamond trade anti-apartheid activity helping the brits genocide the Boers, etc i've no idea about this oh, I don't on that? About the, during the the uh Boer war there was jewish subversion i don't know there's always these conspiracies as, as i said i think i already covered that i think uh jewish uh leaders were prominent among the ANC hierarchy, but the majority of Jews were very comfortable, very wealthy, very wealthy, economically extremely productive, um, uh, you know, had magnificent uh, businesses. My own family, the Beers, uh, w some of the, the, the wealthiest uh, South Africans, had magnificent businesses, and I believe they were quite conservative. So the, the in the interest of a prosperous community was to keep things stable um, and not to destroy that civilization, the troop of Africa. So I would say majority of Jews were um, conservative. And of course you had a minority that was, um, but even Helen Sussman, you know, she was, she was Jewish, right? Um, a liberal in parliament. She stood up to all kinds of depredations and was like a civil libertarian, but even her organization was critical of the new part, the new South Africa. So your family was the De Beers? Oh, uh, my mother's family are from the Beers, yeah. Beers. So the, the uh, diamond, the, 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 the diamond oh, no, people. Oh, no, Beers, Beers, uh, B as, as in bear. Bear. Uh, uh, as it's a, not as the, De Be the, the De Beers, no, no, the B-E-E-R-S. No, no, Beers. Beers, Beers, yeah. And that was a big clothing uh, franchise uh, in Durban. Because I, I I've heard of the De Beers. The De Beers yeah. was the di di diamonds with Cecil Rhodes and yes, uh, yes. Um, that, that was that was serious seriously wealthy. Okay, the some... next question. 
Go yeah, ahead. Sorry. Next question comes. Sorry. Yes. Uh, next question comes from. This is an interesting one. You have to explain who he is to people. But yeah, this is. He's got a white MP as well, a white woman. Um, Ilana, do you see Julius Malema taking power? You know, I haven't kept up with. Uh, I think he's a very small f uh, fraction. I think uh, BBC. Um, uh, st what's that? That hard, tr hard, 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 hard truth. I think what's it called? Hard that talk. program. Hard talk. Yes, hard, the hard truth is my podcast, and Ed will have all my connections below, so you can follow my yeah. podcast. <laughs> Thanks. But uh, he had uh, Malema on, and Malema was quite um, belligerent and, and contemptuous, which I kind of enjoyed, uh, of, of this BBC, extremely good interview. And I think he, he mentioned, uh, Stephen Zirkas did say, you're such a, a minuscule part of the, po the body politic. Um, what are your hopes? So I don't think the communists are going to... Do you think I don't know? I haven't followed things. I don't know what the what the. Well, I guess it depends uh, how, how how I mean, South Africa is going to collapse into absolute disarray, even worse. The ANC now. people are, are pretty disillusioned with the ANC. I think Cape Town is much better, and I think there you have um, uh, the Democrat. I don't. I can't remember the 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 liberal. Um, classical liberal party that rules there but there they they have a chance of seceding and doing doing quite well and of course the demographics lend themselves to a, a better outcome in cape town but i think uh, johannesburg is is a, is a nightmare so no i'm not quite sure about malema i don't think there's a chance of him um ascending to power for people that aren't familiar with him, Malema is this extremist nutcase that wears a red yes. hat. Um, yes, all, all, all... he shouts, kill the whites, kill the Boers. As soon as there's a rally, it's kill the whites, kill the Boers. And that's quite old. I mean, you know, you had him rallying people for anti-white, anti-white... Um, Murderous rampage. It's amazing that there is a white, there is an Africa, I don't know if she's Afrikaans, but there's a white, blonde-haired, young female MP in the South African Parliament for his party, which was just... just oh, what, why is it a... I mean, look at, look at the uh, work females. I mean, her work females is, is it's almost like a, a, an erotic fixation they have, isn't it? Well, yeah, but she isn't... This woman isn't even ugly. Uh, no, I mean, sorry, normally if you're it's ugly... It's an erotic fixation with, um, you know, with, with atavism, with, with um, barbarism. In yeah. fact... In in the the forward to my book, I did offer the book in the in those days, thinking that it was a good topic. I actually did go through the motions. I never will be presenting it to various publishers. And at the time, there was a salacious book doing the rounds of a woman who 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 was among the harem of a black chief. And uh, one publisher said to me, "Well, Ilana, if you can present something more along those lines, it would be welcome." <laughs> you know, so there is this erotic idea of women and yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I, in my own book, which is feminism and the fall of the West, you've got sex fantasies in the 17th century where these women say that the devil appeared to me in the form of a black man and had sex with me from behind for six consecutive nights and sucked <laughs> my dogs. Um. And 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 uh, and so it was in my and and so there is obviously this among these kinds of fast life fishing strategy women there is this fantasization of of black men which makes sense because it is a a risky um, uh, fast life history strategy thing to go for so so I, I suppose that's the thing yeah um, okay the you next should, question, the, you should have okay. mentioned you should have mentioned prowess the the myth of prowess I don't know anything about that. Oh well, yeah, I guess I guess that's true as well. Okay, uh, the next question comes from Yehudi Finkelstein. Thank you, sir. It says, "Ilana, in my lifetime, I have seen political corruption get worse and worse in America. Does this mirror, mirror what happened in South Africa?" You know, I, I do. It's an interesting question too. I do go into corruption, and 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 um, when I wrote the book, I was just still simmering um, as hot as a Babylonian kiln over over the the um, aftershocks of invading Iraq and the corruption and the appropriation of money to even set up radio stations to brainwash Iraqis. And I remember one of the and I cite this in the book. I, I speak about corruption in the in the National Party. And one of the big scandals was the um, Rudy Eschel um, scandal, and and a government and quite a few people fell um, over that. And this, what was the scandal? South Africa appropriated monies to 
to proper, uh, do propaganda overseas. We do this. Nobody calls us corruption anymore to promote the South African perspective overseas. And a government fell in South Africa over that. So in my opinion, as much as people will be outraged, the corruption does not, did not mirror, uh, does not mirror uh, American corruption. What America does, it simply sets standards. It has a parallel universe, which it, it erects and forces people either by the by the um, for, force of the military to to play by its rules. It's just that's what America does. You know, it erects a parallel universe. So, no, I don't think corruption was anything near um, what you see here. As I say, a government fell over. Ed, do you see anything corrupt about a government using taxpayer funds to promote its perspective abroad? An elected government is that corruption? Well, a government fell in South Africa over that, and I go over that um, issue. That was corruption. Yeah, in I South think Africa. I think perhaps on on an everyday level, probably you've got a lot of probably this lot of drive. Um, no, it was what they call affirmative action. In other words, um, whites got the jobs, poor whites got the jobs, so on and so forth. If that if that's corruption, uh, we've had it here for decades. Okay, the next question is from Washability, who says, "What is our guest's opinion on what Dinesh de Souza did to Samuel T. Francis in the '90s, cancelling him from a writer's position in 1995?" People are deluded to think such woke phenomena is not seen from neocons. Um, I don't know the, the perspective, but I do know that I have written about Dinesh de Souza, and I don't much like him. I don't even think he's much of uh, worth uh, listening to. Uh, one of his uh, the worst mistakes. He, he rabbits on endlessly about America being good. Have you heard that sort of collectivist? Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. America yeah. is good. America is a force of good, but there's no such thing as America. And here he's just um, making a categorical mistake. I mean, a country is the sum total of the individuals acting within. There's no such thing as America. Are, are you separating the government? What is he saying? Yes, American people, many of them are good. Is the government good? He always is making these crass, big mistakes in logic. And so I do have a good contempt for him. I don't uh, don't follow him. I'm not familiar with the incident the reader, the, the viewer cites. Can you... Can you tell me about it? No, I think I no, no, I don't know about it. I've seen some documentaries he's, he's by him. One of those crass, he's one of those crass neoconservatives who's uninteresting and unedifying, and he always rubbits on about America is good. On the level of Sean Hannity, maybe a little smarter. Okay, uh, 5007 says they need to bring back South African special forces. Um, thank you very much. Um, uh, Transpar I'll do that one on... Uh, Monday, just about in merit washability. Uh, if body autonomy is conflated with or precedes property and the fetus inside is for some time a part of one's body, is one's child one's property and thus one's body post birth as pre birth? Yeah, interesting. Must I weigh in on that? It, whatever is in your um, body is certainly, uh, is certainly something you can evict. Um, now, I am, as a, as a very conservative libertarian, I certainly am against um, late-term abortion. Of course, we have to define what that means, and that's, that's, a, that's a complicated discussion, isn't that, Ed? When does something... Uh, you, I am against late-term abortion, so I would outlaw that, and I have uh, said that. I think there is a concept in philosophy, you enlarge something enough, and it changes in... The change is qualitative, right? If you enlarge something enough, you make a car big enough and it becomes a bus, right? At some point, a fetus becomes um, a child. So I'm definitely against late-term abortion. And I think women, uh, I'm happy making the argument that a woman should bloody well know she's pregnant. And if she needs to terminate, terminate it when, when it's appropriate to terminate it. If she's gone to full term and wants... Uh, if she's gone to four, five, six months and wants termination, tough luck, tough titties. But but what what if she's like a spiteful, mutant, crazy, blue-haired bitch? Uh, yeah, no, I'm against late-term abortion. Sorry to disappoint. Well, she's got, <laughs> the mother's got blue hair, Alana. <laughs> uh, it's so uninteresting to me as a woman who hasn't, who's not of child 
bearing or rearing age. It's kind of, I don't know. No, don't. but like, surely I'm saying if a woman has got blue hair, that's basically yes. saying that she's sort of not human. So, so is it the, the, allowed to. I'm the saying, yeah, make, exce uh, make I'm exception. I'm against abortion. You want me to make an exception? You make no, it. No, okay, we'll, 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 we'll agree to differ on this, but I, I personally think that if um, yeah. crazy mentors want to have offspring, that's probably I'm against good. Latum. I'm against Latum. By that time, the, the idiot should know that she is pregnant, avail herself of abortion earlier on. I'm absolutely uninterested. I'm, I'm, I cannot believe the conservatives who will, are so self um that they can stop their political enemies from, uh, you know, evacuating and, and doing their DNCs or whatever it is. Um, yeah, why would you want to stop your political enemies from, from aborting your future political scraping enemies? Their, it's, it's, scraping their uteruses. Um, yeah. So yeah, scraping I, their, yeah. But I'm so, all right. Anyway, look, the next question comes from Alex Redburn, who says, You both make a really good point about abortion. It's a good thing America legalized it in the 60s or 70s. Otherwise, it would be run by left wing mutants and full of black people committing crime. Yeah. Um, it's fair you know, it, it, is, it is something. You're, you're a, a young man, and so you talk about abortion in, in um, connection with mutants. But I come from a, a, a time where I do remember. Abortion was not associated with uh, mutants, um, and, and and there were serious issues, and there were valid issues, and this is why the mutants appropriating very valid pain. Women, when I were growing up, we knew stories of women who just couldn't have babies; they couldn't have a baby with a certain man, or or you know, I had African women, an African woman who, who the, the book is actually dedicated to her, um, Ethel Nomasomi. She came to me and she said, help me. I have five. I can't feed them, you know. So we, Ed, you, you, you talk about mutants and that's, um, you know, that, 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 that looks at, it is a function of affluence. Now the mutants are demanding everything. But in a, it, it, there was a time when abortion was very serious and a very um, sad affair for many women. And that pain is valid. And maybe older women like myself should should remind um, a younger generation that the complaints the young mutants with the blue hair are making are invalid compared to what used to happen with backstreet abortions, with terrible predicaments, women who could simply could not have, did not need to have children with abusive um, men, so on and so forth. So there were true, true tragedies that we, d a different era. Yeah, yeah, but I, I, if they want to have an abortion, I suppose that's fine as well. Um, what, um, Laughing Tucker says, what do you think of Simon Roach and the Sudlanders? They have a plan to create a safe zone for whites in case of the inevitable collapse. Um, are you talking about the... I'm not... Sure, Oh, oh, well, never mind. Then. What um, is the name uh, of the uh, white... Uh, wrote the Sud, Sud, as in the Afrikaans word for South. Sud, yeah, yeah. Sudlanders, Sudlanders. And they want, he says, they've got a safe zone. They, they want to create a safe zone for whites in the case of inevitable collapse. And he's saying, what do you think of the idea? Well, there is one already. Uh, what is what is the name of that... Um, God, my memory's terrible. Oriana. Oriana. Is it... This, do you mean the place, the way everyone's white? It's called Oriana. That's right. Very safe, very wonderful place. And I am fascinated. I think it's a wonderful uh, idea and it's becoming quite, property is quite... Orania. Um, Orania, 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 not yeah. Orania, Orania, yeah. And so that's in um, the, the small Karoo, I think, Klein Karoo, I'm not sure. Um, and that's becoming quite quite popular. I think property is becoming very expensive. That's not it's, for whites, though. You've got, you've got to be Afrikaans. Orania, Orania, yes. Orania is... Yeah. Oh, yes, it is... I'm familiar with Orania, and I always thought, how would I get into Orania? I'm not Afrikaans. Um, it, it's a wonderful place. It's it's working very well, and I don't understand by what grace it is allowed to function under the law. And that goes to your point, uh, Ed, which I wasn't able to actually um, speak to because I'm not up to date. There must be pockets of of uh, secession and existence that are beyond the the, the state. Because Orania yeah. is surviving. And that's the difference between America and South Africa. Uh, the American managerial state, the American deep state, is so omnipotent and so efficient that we couldn't have that. We couldn't have there that. There are certain areas. I mean, I think, I think for a long time, the fundamentalist Mormons 
in uh, Colorado City uh, 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 and Hilldale on the Arizona Utah border, but, but I went there uh, a years ago, and they they were ba basically up, up in the mountains, and they were basically beyond the control of the state uh, for a lot not in, not anymore, but the, they they were for a very long time, and then I think that if you've got uh, the Amish, I think it's almost like an exchange. Just leave us alone, leave us alone, and what about what the was it with the Amish? There were massacres. Um, no, it was the. It was the. There was the uh, Mormons, Mormons, Mormons massacred, yeah. massacred um, people that came through the California. And, the, and the, the the war between the states, the war of northern northern aggression. Uh, Lincoln couldn't have the South secede, and that's where the whole. Um, you know the whole. But then, but, no, but then he, he couldn't have the South secede. But then after, but it was ballsing up. He he left them alone. He I don't know which president it was. Um, uh, Jackson, I guess, um, uh, decided to just look, just leave them alone. So it was kind of beyond the law. It was kind of they just could do what they wanted uh, within certain boundaries. Well, reconstruction was very vicious. Yeah, but then there was a period where they were vicious to them, and and then they they, they realized it was balling up the economy to be this nasty to them, and so they just sort of left them alone. I think, but, but I, I think I guess there, there must be parts of a big country like America that are beyond the law. But right, the next question comes from Hibernian perspective. Thank you very much, sir. And he says, "What are Ilana's thoughts on anti-Semitism? The term has long been considered obsolete, and yet the label will not die. Why do Jewish people get to have a monopoly on that word? Why not other Semitic groups?" Was the invasion of Iraq anti-Semitic? If I held Estonians in contempt, would I be considered anti-Indo-European? Well, no, because Estonians aren't Indo-European. Um, mm -hmm. It's not just liberals, but many libertarians uh, and caps, etc. Uh, anyway, your thoughts on the on the phrase anti-Semitic? That's the question. Yeah, I think uh, there, there's a place to let go already. Uh, anti-Semitic. Look, I I encounter I, I encounter that. I think I have. Um, Certainly on Un's review, there used to be uh, comments that nobody, you know, now they are actually have suddenly accepted me, my anti-Semites, I call them. But the comments were so crude, were so awful, uh, sexualizing, and, oh, it was just just really terrible. But so there is such a thing as anti -Semitism. I'm not terribly interested in anti-Semitism. Uh, I keep thinking as an individualist, I keep thinking, well, some people should meet me as, as an individual and assess me. Uh, based on on who I am, I guess you don't like individualism, do you? But but I am one. So I've never thought deeply about anti-Semitism. Is there such a thing as anti-Semitism? Of course. Um, do I see it in the way people, my readers, some readers address me? Yes. Um, I ignore it. I ignore it. What do you? What what aspect of it should I address? Tell me, Ed. I don't know. I don't know. I think he just. I think he was just interested in the fact that the term anti a semite is not just a Jew. It's anybody who is Semitic. So you know, the Ethiopians speak a Semitic language. The Somalis speak a Semitic language, don't they? So the question is, why is it that the term has, has become exclusively a term for people that have a problem with Jews? I, I, can't, give, I can't give you the history of an, of the term anti-Semitism. I just don't know. It. Anti-Semitism is real. Uh, I think the, the anti-Semitic right denies that it's real. It's definitely real. Um, yeah, I'm not, okay. I'm, I'm, really I'm, involved, I'm, I'm not terribly involved or interested. I sort of uh, shut off from things. I'm, I'm, I'm very lazy in terms of things that I'm not interested in. Oh. Uh, anti-Semitism doesn't terribly interest me. I don't think America is anti-Semitic. I think the ADL is is absolutely disgusting in claiming that. I think tracing, in as much as the ADL and other groups trace um, anti-Semitic groups, I, I, I despise that. And in fact, I would say that the fact that Jews who were here from the inception, it's very interesting, Ed, Jews were here from the inception, from the founding, that they are suddenly so comfortable situating themselves amongst the multicultural mob it shows what ignorance philosophically, historically, and what a disservice they do to Jews because the Jewish community was, it was even Washington uh, mentioned um, the Jews of early America. So the Muslims were not here other than trading slaves. Jews were here. And uh, I think they demean themselves by casting themselves as a group among the Multi, multicultural uh, mob. In addition, I know that a lot of our your your viewers probably don't like the concept, um, the Judeo-Christian. Remind me why it's such a bad thing to say. 
But I'm sorry to remind you, Jesus was Jewish, very Jewish. People think he looked angelic and so on. He probably looked more like me than the little calendars that you that you market. Um, and certainly Christianity, you know, was Jesus, very much Jesus, in Jesus was was a Red Sea pedestrian. Yeah, that's that's for sure. Absolutely. Um, how, do you know, how do you know he was Jewish? Well, um, said he was. Definitely Jewish. But I'm yes, just going to say the, it's, a, it's a balance. On the one hand, if Kevin McDonald is right, then it makes sense that Jewish people do not want to have a society if they are a minority. They don't want to have a society where white people are highly nationalistic, and so they will uh, engineer. You know, against that. Because, you know, he was Jewish because his mother thought he was God, and he thought she was a virgin. Well, no, you know, he was Jewish because he went to the temples and whatever, and he was definitely Jewish. But um. But then, but then, on the other hand, Jewish people, are Ashkenazi Jews, are highly intelligent, and they become rich, and this becomes a source of resentment as well. So there's these, there's these two, th these two things involved. I think that's that's yes, but anti-Semitic uh, anti-Semitism certainly in East Europe uh, also disenfranchised Jews from mainstream academia and commerce. So uh, they did in create vital uh, small economies. Um, you know, so there was that disenfranchisement of, of Jews in, in Europe, certainly, and pogroms and so on. So as, as a child, I certainly grew up hearing about pogroms. Okay. And and that, heaviness, that heaviness that Jews keep reminding people and they do, uh, they're always pushing this down everybody's gullet. Yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't think that, yeah. We, yeah, we've all got problems. I mean, my, my parents live in a hard water area. Um, this can add 20 pounds a year to your water bill. Anyway, look, the next question comes from um, uh, Eric Henches, who says, obviously not all Jews are like the ADL, SPLC, Bolshevism, Frankfurt School, but is there something inherit, inherit to Jews to be attracted to these ideas? Um, what do you think about that? Yeah, I think that certainly being uh, disenfranchised drew um, drew Jews to, to Bolshevism and they they played a terrible and a tremendous role in, in, in the early revolution, didn't they, in, in 1917? There's no denying that. So is that um, disenfranchisement that, that you want to make um, society safe for your tribe? I'm not sure. I'm not a student uh, of these things. Are you, Ed? Have you, have you looked into that? I, 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 would I think it would be it would make sense. I'm. I don't. I'm. Zimbabwe, for some reason, is a pet interest of mine. I've never been there, but it just fascinated me the way that they could make this rich society out of a, the, what five percent of the population was white, and they were mostly nutty, like the Duke of Buccleuch that used to go up in a helicopter and shoot at people for fun. I mean, they were mad. These people running Rhodesia, um, and uh, and uh, you notice there that the whites, when it was white rule, are right wing. And then when it was Mugabe, suddenly they're all voting for the movement for democratic change. That's right. Which was That's a so right. socialist left wing party of the trade unions. Now, have these white farmers all suddenly become socialists? Of course they haven't. It's just that Mugabe went from being a socialist or a communist once he was in power to being a black nationalist. And therefore, they don't want to have a black nationalist society. And that's the kind of society that Morgan Changarai, God bless him, yes. uh, was, was, was trying to promote. So, so it it's, makes perfect sense. If I was Jewish, I, I, I think perhaps I. I feel, I feel the same way, that you, you don't want a nationalist society, a white nationalist society, so you would act in the interests of the left. Um, and yes, that seems when, to be when, when I do notice that anti-Semites blame Jews for white Christian wasp wokeism. And it's always the Jews' fault when the, you know, I mean, the wasp is, is has sort of, uh, you know, promulgated this this kind of thinking pop christianity is no longer doctrinaire is that jewish fault it's pop christianity and pop christianity and and the therapeutic society issues from um evangelical society right so everything is blamed um on jews yeah even i think it's an element it's an element as i've argued in my own research i think that you it's it's the collapse of society multicultural uh, um eugenics uh, all this stuff it's happening in japan for God's sake, there's no Jews there, or there's very few Jews there. So, so you can't possibly say that it's. But anyway, I've had this discussion so many times. Uh, the next question comes from, or well, final question, I guess it is. Oh, two more questions. Uh, uh, Kerry says, um, "Not a question. I just want to say, great guest, really interesting takes." 
Thank you. There you go. You can press Kerry. And finally, Alex Redmond says, a question for Ilana. You said earlier you would be willing to forfeit women's suffrage because it would make the country more meritocratic and less egalitarian. Would you also support restrictions on Jews holding positions of power to make society less leftist? Fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> It's uh, it's funny the way that the the, the Afrikaners well you're not Afrikaner but they, they they say this off off and it's an old English a hundred years ago yes, or so. horrible horrible accents very very harsh I hate myself hundred years ago or so a posh person would yeah. say you know, he he she she's gone off to the north and a, a word <laughs> not to say he's gone off to the north but then in the middle they say off to the north I really so, am. Uh, I'm pro-individualism, assess individuals based on offers, based on their merit. Um, you know, some of the greatest libertarians that I admire, my mentor is Jewish. Should he be banned from academia? He's done more good than anything. He certainly converted me to the truth, um, to libertarian. My, my, my PhD supervisor was a rabbi. I just like to... Oh, really? <laughs> That's unusual. I was a New York rabbi. Yeah. My but look, I, I def, I'm not po popular among my own tribe. I can't say that my, I'm going to say that 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 my la, my extended family has ever extended me any anything but appropriation, you know, but opprobrium. Um, so of course there are resentments, but do I think that people should be banned based on their group affinity, their religion, or based on their abilities, their skill? Look at an individual as an individual. So yeah. Yeah, fair enough. Okay, then um, I'd like to thank uh, Ilana for coming on. It's been a jolly interesting discussion. Uh, and if you would like to um, see any of Ilana's stuff, then I have put the link, uh, the links uh, below. Uh, this will now be put on BitChute and Odyssey. Um, Ilana, is there anything you're working on that we should uh, we should know about? First of all, thank you, Ed, for having me on. I've, I love it, and I uh, hope to come on and chat with you again. Uh, yes, I'm always scrambling to do books. That the, the part of doing a column that's based on first principles, that it's always correct. So you can really co – a lot of the um, Cannibal and uh, my other books are, um, you know, the basis of them are my columns. So I am working on a book um, on democracy, and the next one is on race. Well, that should be very, very interesting. So look yeah. out look out for that, folks. Uh, perhaps I'll get you on here to talk about that one. No, but I better not get you on here to talk about that. I have to, to be very careful. But anyway, yes. All right. So I'll see you all on Monday. And goodbye. Thank you.